Could I ask members to be a bit quieter leaving the chamber, please? Still pretty noisy. If you didn't hear me, can I ask members to be a bit quieter leaving the chamber, please? Thank you. The final item of business today is a members' business debate on motion number 565 in the name of Miles Briggs on opposition to centralisation of cleft lip and palate surgery. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Would those members who wish to speak in this debate please press the request to speak buttons as soon as possible. And I call on Miles Briggs to open the debate. Around seven minutes, please, Mr Briggs. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to start by thanking colleagues from my own party and from all the other opposition parties in Parliament for supporting my motion and allowing this evening's debate to take place. I'd also very much like to welcome constituents and others to the public gallery this evening, including the East Scotland cleft patients and parents, especially Yvonne McClatchy, who has done such a fantastic job in campaigning on this issue, spearheading the online petition, which now has attracted the support of more than 6,000 people across Scotland, and which I was pleased to accept this afternoon on behalf of the Parliament. During the Scottish Parliament election campaign, I met a number of Lothian parents who expressed real concerns at the way in which the consultation to centralise cleft palate surgery in Scotland was being handled. I made a promise that I would support them and take up their cause if elected to Parliament. What I found heartening and incre incredibly positive is to hear their personal family stories repeated again and again by parent after parent. Stories of the excellent treatment and best possible quality surgery their babies and children have received from the Edinburgh Sick Kids Surgery Team. And the life-changing and life-defining difference that this has made to so many babies and children across Scotland. Deputy Presiding Officer, it is not an oversight to say that the cleft lip and palate surgery carried out by surgeon Felicity Meandale in Edinburgh is world-leading and that the outcomes are some of the very best any child or parent could ask. But it's not just down solely to Miss Meandale, but the first class team she has surrounding her, theatre staff, post and pre-op staff, highly skilled cleft nurses, all working closely together. The audited outcomes for the Edinburgh Surgical Unit explain why parents are right to have such faith in it. Official information on UK standards for speech outcomes following surgery to repair cleft palate shows that the results for children treated in Edinburgh are very high and consistently so, with the vast majority of children having speech within normal range within five years after surgery, beating national targets and putting Edinburgh amongst the top performing units in the whole of the UK. I'm sorry to say that this information was not part of the options appraisal official consultation process and was only made available as a result of freedom of information request, something which is of real concern to parents and campaigners. This information should have been made available and I'm sorry to say feeds into the genuine worries about other aspects of what I can say seems to me to have been a flawed consultation process. One which has failed to justify the suggestion that the East of Scotland service is in any way unsustainable and one which has left clinicians and staff in Edinburgh feeling their views have been totally ignored. I'm sorry to say that these are, uh, there are recurrent instances of a lack of transparency, openness and accountability surrounding the whole consultation. We also need to recognise that the Edinburgh team doesn't just enjoy the support of parents and other clinicians across Scotland and the UK, but has an international reputation for its care, research and expertise. Indeed, such is its standing that the Edinburgh unit is due to host the prestigious International Congress on Cleft Lip, Palate and Related Craniofacial Anomalies in 2021. 1,800 professionals from over 70 countries are set to attend the 2017 conference in India and similar numbers will be expected for the Edinburgh conference. How embarrassing will it be for Scotland if Miss Meandale feels forced to leave the NHS and neither she nor a cleft surgery unit is actually any longer based in the host city Edinburgh? I'm also concerned at the unintended consequences of closing the Edinburgh surgery unit. At present, St John's Hospital in Livingston is home to the adult cleft palate care service, which is supported by Miss Meandale and her team. The impact which a closure of the Edinburgh unit will have on adult services in the area and patients who receive their treatment there has never been outlined. In fact, from my investigations, I can only draw the conclusion that this has indeed not been considered or worse still overlooked. Many parents have also expressed concern to me about the additional stress and pressures that would be placed on them and their children 
through the extra tra time, travel costs and time off work that would be required to travel to Glasgow. The Scottish Government talks about accessibility in our NHS, but the centralisation plans would make access more difficult for many families in eastern Scotland. It's perhaps also worth noting that it's not long since the Aberdeen service was closed and parents and children were supported through the Edinburgh service. Taking all these points together, widespread parental and community support for the Edinburgh surgery unit, outstanding audited outcomes and international reputation, concerns about the consultation process and worries about accessibility of a single service based in Glasgow. It's hardly any wonder that the Clef Pit, Clef Lip and Pallet Association and many others are struggling to understand the rationale behind proposals to centralise the service in Glasgow and believe the case for changing the current two-site model simply has not been made. I want to be clear that this is not an issue of Edinburgh versus Glasgow and must not become one. Rather, it's about supporting a two-site model that works and that is sustainable and can be made even more effective through the collaborative working of the surgeons across both sites. This twin centre model works successfully elsewhere in the UK and it's about maintaining and preserving the international centre of excellence which is built up and, and, and has delivered such specialist expertise, knowledge and care. Deputy Presiding Officer, sometimes governments make bad decisions. I have no doubt in my mind at all that the closure of the cleft lip and palate surgery unit at the Edinburgh Sick, Sick Kids as well as the potential loss of an internationally recognised specialist surgeon to our NHS would be a backward step for our health service. I hope in bringing this debate to the Parliament that I've given Scottish Ministers a chance to pause and reflect and prevent this from happening. I'll end by urging Scot the Scottish Government to listen to the very clear views of parents and clinici clinicians and ask that they do not approve the centralisation plans, but rather support the retention of what is a successful and valuable two-site model. This is in the best interest of parents, clinicians, and crucially, babies and children born in Scotland needing this specialist surgery and care. Can I First of all, please say to those of you who are very welcome in the public gallery that I understand the strength of feeling that you're here to support. Could I ask, though, that you refrain um, from clapping um, from now on? And uh, perhaps at the end, once the debate is over, we can allow that for the contributions that people have made. Thank you very much. And I now call on Angus MacDonald to be followed by Neil Finlay. Um, speeches of around four minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. I appreciate the opportunity to join this debate on the centralisation of cleft lip and palate surgery, and can I thank Miles Briggs for taking this important issue to the Chamber. Uh, I have a specific interest in this, as I have constituents who will be directly affected by the proposal to move these services. Now, uh, the Cabinet Secretary or the Minister will be aware that uh, the current provision of specialist cleft surgical services at the Royal Sick Children's Hospital in Edinburgh is exemplary. The recent consultation and report finding that centralising these services in Greater Glasgow and Clyde is the best decision to make, uh, I think, doesn't fully take into consideration the impact this will have on families reliant on this service in the east of Scotland. And of course, we must also take into consideration the service provided in Edinburgh itself, which is led by a pioneering and world-class surgeon whose record of excellence speaks for itself. In Edinburgh, there is a multidisciplinary team which works side by side with the patients and the surgeon to ensure that everything runs smoothly and that progress is made after every surgical event. And a hospital which is known to its patients as somewhere they can rely on to get the job done are all very valid reasons as to why the government should consider ensuring support services are retained in Edinburgh. Now, as I mentioned at the outset, I have constituents who will be directly affected by the movement of these services. And I can say with some confidence that they're dismayed that this service provision is not going to be as close to them as they need it to be. I have a great deal of sympathy for their opposition to move this service to Greater Glasgow and Clyde and would ask that any centralisation plans be paused to allow further consideration and to ensure that the specialist expertise, knowledge and care that has been built up in Edinburgh is not lost. I understand that change can be a good thing and I understand that there are financial pressures on all NHS boards throughout the country. However, it's my opinion that in this instance, uh, having surgi a surgical team in a single area bodes well for the provision of services in the long term. However, for these services to be taken from Edinburgh presents us with a deficit which is geographical in nature and with the real possibility that world-class surgeons may 
or may not be able to relocate when or if the service is, due to, uh, is moved. I have for some time now been in touch with my constituent in relation to her concerns over this uh, issue and have raised the, the, the issue with the Cabinet Secretary on more than one occasion when the proposal was highlighted to me. Understandably, she is worried about the impact this will have on her family in the short term. Moving from one area to another can sometimes feel as if they have to start again. Moving clinical notes from one health board area to another gives insight into the patient and their history, but it doesn't mean that they really know a patient. All of those relationships that have been built up over many years in certain circumstances will potentially have to be re rebuilt from the ground up. Putting myself in the position of a young child who is already in a situation where they are facing surgery to enable them to live a better quality of life going forward must be a very daunting prospect to begin with. So to have the upheaval, upheaval of being treated in another hospital where they are unfamiliar must be an added stress that does not necessarily need to be the case. President Officer, I was contacted by a retired consultant plastic surgeon, John Howard Stevenson, who was the advisor in the speciality of cleft surgical services to the chief medical officer and clinical director of special services within NHS Tayside which included the disciplines within reconstructive plastic surgery and dentistry, crucial to successful outcomes in cleft lip and palate reconstruction. During this period in office, these services were centralised in Edinburgh when Ms Felicity Meandale was appointed as a consultant with responsibility for these patients. He wrote to me saying that the clinical evidence supported services being retained in Edinburgh and that a world-class surgeon and the service that she had built up in Edinburgh was not only one of the best in the UK, but was recognised as being of an international standard. Um, I would like to quote him direct, uh, President Officer, um, quickly. Uh, he, he said, since her appointment, she has developed a service for patients with cleft lip and palate in Edinburgh serving the east of Scotland, which has delivered the highest quality of service as evidenced by the internationally agreed outcome standards within this discipline. These results clearly demonstrate consistently higher results than anywhere else in Scotland and on a par with the best internationally. To achieve these, it is essential to build up a close team involving specialities such as speech therapy, and Felicity has been very successful in building up and maintaining such a team. Further, patients and their families have the highest regard for her and her team. To relocate cleft services from Edinburgh centralising in Glasgow will undermine an outstanding service and goes against the overwhelming clinical evidence, which surely must always be the defining factor in deciding where a service should be located, which unequivocally confirms Edinburgh as the base from which patients undergoing cleft lip and palate repair in Scotland can expect the best outcomes. End of quote. I realise I'm out of time, President Officer. I, do, I did have more to say, however, I would... Yes, but I, I think we've heard enough. I would, urge, I would urge the Cabinet Interesting Secretary... Interesting though to, it is, Mr MacDonald. <laughs> I would urge the Cabinet Secretary to seriously consider the option of retaining this world-class service in Edinburgh. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I have Mr Finlay to be followed by Alison Johnson, please. Uh, thanks, President Officer, and uh, uh, thanks to uh, uh, Miles Briggs for securing this very important members' debate. Um, the proposal to end the uh, surgical service at the Sick Kids in Edinburgh and to centralise the cleft lip and palate service in Glasgow comes against the backdrop of huge financial pressures on our NHS. Uh, the boards across Scotland are having to find huge amounts of money and are finding black holes in their budget. NHS Lothian alone this year has an 84, yes, 84 million deficit. Beds closed, post cuts, and legally set targets to be missed. And the centralisation of services like this, I believe, are directly, directly linked to budget decisions, but will, of course, be dressed up and presented as service improvements and redesign. And there will be much more to come. We've just it fended off the plans to centralise children's services and now we're on to the next stage of the process. Uh, I, I come to this conclusion, President Officer, there appears to be no other credible explanation for the move that we're debating today. In fact, this, de this decision has provoked complete bemusement amongst many stakeholders, patient groups and doctors. People are frankly at a loss uh, to understand why this decision has been made and some serious questions hang over it. Um, the outcomes in Edinburgh appear to be better. If the whole issue in healthcare just now is about outcomes, then why is a service with excellent outcomes being closed down and centralised? Perhaps the Minister could confirm if the better outcomes in Edinburgh have been taken into account when making this decision. What about the excellent continuity of care to be found in other 
Uh, regions such as Tayside, Grampian and Highland, relationships built up over the last 10 years will be compromised. Why is a service that has developed those excellent relationships across the east of the country not being nurtured and protected. Certainly. Just Campbell. to be very clear that this is about the surgery and it locally uh, provided support, whether it's orthodontics or, or through dentistry, those will still be, and continue to be provided locally. Neil yes, Finlay. Well, well, we may come, to, come back to that. What is, the, um, what is the evidence base being used to justify ending the twin site surgery centres when we see twin site uh, working well in other parts of the UK? Has that, this approach uh, not worked in Scotland? If so, could the Minister share the evidence that tells us that this approach hasn't worked? And this is one of many, the many concerns that have been highlighted. Uh, given the evidence and the justified criticisms of parents and campaigners, there appears to be only one explanation for this decision. And once again, it boils down to cuts to public services and our NHS dressed up, dressed up and camouflaged as service redesign and improvement. Now, the Scottish uh, Government makes its own choices, and many of these are bad choices that are not serving the people of Scotland well. This decision is simply the latest in a long line of centralising decisions that have rod roughshod over the wishes of patient staff and com campaigners. Uh, it's about time the Government started to use the powers of this place to ensure ad adequate funding is provided to our NHS and indeed other public services. We can do it. We need the political will. And after all, these are the services that the public needs, and they're the services that I believe that civilise us as a, as a society. There's no doubt in my mind that the Cleft Lip and Pallet Service in Edinburgh is providing a vital service that we should value and protect. And as such, the Cabinet Secretary should intervene and reconsider and then reverse this decision. A decade ago, the SNP trashed the CARE report and cynically exploited the NHS for electoral gain. Whatever happened to the mantra of keep health care local? President officer, uh, for the Minister and the Cabinet Secretary and the Government, the sky is dark with chickens coming home to roost. The Chief Medical Officer talks about the concept of realistic medicine. Well, this is the reality of the NHS in Scotland in 2016. Have it, Alison Johnson, to be followed by Donald Cameron. Um, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd first like to congratulate Miles Briggs on securing a debate on this very important issue for young children needing cleft surgery and their families, both in Lothian Region and across the country. And I'd like to thank the Royal College of Surgeons for their views and guidance. I understand that they support the principle of centralisation where there are clear clinical benefits for doing so. It can help staff to specialise further and support high clinical standards. However, in the short time I have today, I want to voice the principal concerns raised with me by constituents and professionals about the pending decision to centralise all cleft surgery. Concerns around how the review of surgery arrangements has been conducted, the quality of the consultation and the impact of cleft care in the Lothian region and across Scotland. I have some doubts that the premise on which the review of services has been conducted is reasonable. It was launched because the current model of delivering a single service over two sites has not, it is claimed, resulted in a properly integrated service. But instead of considering why this hasn't happened and what could be done to improve integration, the Cleft Management Board proceeded straight to considering new options. Indeed, some members of the panel that appraised the options in October last year queried whether it was worth evaluating the status quo at all. And so I am concerned that it wasn't given a fair hearing by the appraisal panel. The lack of detail as to why the current arrangement is not working was criticised by a large number of submissions to the options appraisal from parents. Clinicians, parents and the Cleft Lip and, Lip and Palate Association, the charity representing patients with clefts and their families, have repeatedly asked for information about what aspects of the current arrangements weren't working, but they feel an answer has never been fully provided. They've publicly stated that they've not been provided with sufficient information to make an informed, evidence-based decision on whether or not to support these proposals. And according to Surgeon John Clark, twin site cleft services operate well across the UK, for example, in Liverpool and Manchester. 
Considering why integration has been more successful elsewhere compared to Glasgow and Edinburgh doesn't appear to have been a significant part of the appraisal. And until we're certain exactly where problems delivering the existing service lie, what further support could improve these, can we be sure that moving to a single site service is the most appropriate solution? I would suggest not. The appraisal document makes reference to the significant differences in the outcome between the Glasgow and Edinburgh surgery sites, but were these differences fully taken into account? This concern has been raised by a number of surgeons formerly involved in cleft care. Edinburgh's track record in terms of the percentage of children having normal speech after primary surgery far exceeds that of Glasgow. And according to John Hammond, retired consultant orthodontist, the number of children treated in Glasgow failing to achieve the normal speech benchmark is 60 children in every 100 undergoing pal palatal repair surgery, a failure rate almost double that in the East. Now, while I'm by no means suggesting that this is with out with the normal range of success for cleft surgery, there are nonetheless clear differences on a number of measures of success, and we should seek to understand why. It's worth noting that representatives of families scored the current arrangement more highly than either centralisation than either centralisation option during the options appraisal, but it's not clear how this figures in the final decision. Deputy Presiding Officer, in light of the National Specialist Service Committee's observation that there were shortcomings in the consultation process, I'd urge the Minister to look again at these proposals with particular reference to the excellent surgical outcomes achieved in Edinburgh and the strong views of patients and staff. Given the concerns of patients and staff cited in the consultation report, the concerns about the overall consultation process expressed by the National Specialist Service Committee, it is absolutely unclear that a single site service based in Glasgow will lead to better clinical outcomes for current patients. And given that twin site cleft services operate very well elsewhere, further steps must be taken to look at supporting the current service in Edinburgh to assure continuity of care for, pa for patients and families in Lothian and the east of Scotland. Thank you. Donald Cameron. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm delighted to support the motion submitted by my colleague, Miles Briggs, on this very important issue, and would also like to echo some of the remarks on this matter raised by colleagues across this chamber who made very compelling arguments in favour of retention. This is a very emotive subject, as can be seen from the many thousands of submissions put forward by concerned parents and campaigners, some of whom sit, sit behind me today. One of the first meetings I had as an MSP following the election in May was with such campaigners, and indeed my first correspondence with the Cabinet Secretary was about this very service. I completely empathise with the position of these campaigners and want to use this opportunity to defend the cleft service in Edinburgh. I have a personal perspective to offer too, a niece and nephew of mine were born with cleft palates, and they have both been through the Edinburgh service with great success. The Cleft Care Scotland network noted that the centre in Edinburgh performs nearly half of Scotland's cleft surgical procedures each year, and over half of these are for patients who reside in the Lothians region. In that sense, it's easy to see this simply as a local issue. However, it's important to realise that the reach of this service goes far beyond this city, far beyond the Lothians region, and indeed far beyond the central belt. I represent the Highlands and Islands, and according to the NHS's cons consultation document on this proposed change, a figure of between 5 to 10% of the total number of Scottish patients come from my region. As a result, I have been contacted by parents, patients and their families who come from my region, a long, long way from the city, but who have used the Edinburgh Search Centre because it is a world-renowned service and possesses one of the world's leading cleft surgeons in Dr. Felicity Minda. We should listen to some of the medical experts. Isabel McCallum, the former clinical director of the Edinburgh Sick Children's Hospital, has questioned the clarity of the proposals, saying that it is not at all clear how patients would benefit from a centralised service and how the clinical service would be enhanced. Maureen Harrison, the former CEO of the Sick Kids Friends Foundation, also stated she didn't believe that centralisation 
would be the best way forward for children in the east of Scotland. It is clear from the 6,000 plus supporters who have signed the petition set up to oppose centralisation of this service that many of them have not just benefited from the existence of two cleft centres in Scotland, but believe in the retention of two centres. It is also clear that there is support across this chamber for both centres to remain. And I was very grateful to hear the contribution of Angus MacDonald, because I have to say, it is disappointing to note that no SNP members, even Lothian's SNP MSPs, have actually signed Miles Briggs's motion. Presiding officer, the evidence that I have seen and heard from campaigners show this process to be rushed and lacking any consideration for the voices of the people who have benefited from the cleft surgery service in Edinburgh. Former health professionals have questioned the proposals and thousands of people have added their voices to the debate. I believe that there is a clear and compelling argument to retain this important service and accordingly I will be supporting the motion today. I now call on Aileen Campbell. Around seven minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, everyone here shares the same desire. We want to ensure the cleft surgery is safe and consistently able to deliver good patient outcomes. And Miles Briggs is right. The work our professionals do creates a life-defining difference to children and families' lives. And he was right to point to that in his opening remarks. And I'm well aware of the strength of feeling from those who oppose a recommendation to consolidate cleft surgery in Glasgow. I recognise they believe they're raising real concerns about the proposal. I therefore welcome tonight's debate from Miles Briggs and the positive and con or the constructive contributions from Angus MacDonald, from Alison Johnson uh, and Donald Cameron, Cameron. And I particularly want to thank Donald for his own personal reflections on tonight's debate as well. It, prevents, it presents an opportunity to help inform our shared understanding of the issues involved and also tonight's debate allows us to clear up some of the issues that others have raised. And can I also though, personally place uh, on record my thanks to Yvonne McClatchy, who I met earlier today, who shares our ambition for improvements, but does so with passion and dedication. So I want to thank her for her time and for articulating her concerns and that of the others who I know are here in the chamber this evening. Our national clinical strategy is our blueprint for health and social care over the next 15 years. It's one of the key drivers that will help us deliver transformational change across our NHS. The strategy makes, clear, makes it clear that if we are to provide the best outcomes for patients, services need to be planned on a population based once for Scotland basis. So we must look to increase collaborative working across NHS Scotland to deliver services that will benefit all patients no matter where they live. In delivering an NHS that's fit for the future, patients should rightly expect our health services to be safe and sustainable. And sustainable means services must be consistently able to deliver high quality treatment and care. The recommendation to consolidate cleft surgery, and it's important that we rem re re remind ourselves that it's only a recommendation, has been made with the National Clinical Strategies ethos in mind. Patients should expect no less. And in response to Neil Finlay, this has nothing to do with costs. It's about ensuring high standards of services. And the proposals that we have brought, we brought forward are cost neutral. Experience also tells us that patients and families want the best treatment available and are willing to travel to access the excellent care our highly specialist services provide. However, in delivering transformational NHS change, there will be those who oppose it and who have genuinely held concerns articulated by many members here this evening. Maintaining two centres remains an option, but the two centre model as it stands does raise questions of sustainability, particularly with a single surgeon operating alone in Edinburgh. Services need to be resilient to unexpected absences, so patients receive their surgery when they need it. And I know some families are worried a surgeon might leave if the recommendation is approved. And let me be absolutely clear, we do not want that to happen and we'll do what we can to keep all the surgeons working here in Scotland. But we must design a national cleft sur surgery service that is resilient to such risks. And we must plan and deliver services that will achieve the best outcomes for all of Scotland's patients. And that's why one option is a collaborative three surgeon team. 
It's been suggested that a single team will be better able to share the workload, to learn from each other and improve patient outcomes in a collaborative manner for the benefit of all CLEF patients across Scotland. There are alternative options, as we've heard this evening from Miles Briggs and Angus Macdonald and others who have contributed to this debate, and we are seriously considering each and every one of them. Whichever service model is adopted, we very much hope to retain the specialist knowledge that we have here in Scotland and build a collaborative three surgeon team that works well together. Work is underway, which is actively seeking to support the Glasgow and Edinburgh surgeons to make that happen. And in terms of the 2021 conference that I think Miles Briggs referenced, this will be an opportunity to showcase good results across the whole of Scotland and not just concentrating on one area. Differences in speech outcomes have also been highlighted as an issue and work is ongoing to look at these data in more detail to try and understand what they tell us. And we shall consider the findings alongside all of the information that will guide our decision making. The online petition clearly indicates the strength of opposition to the proposals from the East. But it's important to highlight that it suggests there will be a reduction in local CLEF services if the recommendation is approved. And in response to that and the concerns raised by Miles Briggs about the impact on other related services, I've been given a categoric assurance that the proposed change is really only to CLEF surgery. Orthodontics, speech therapy, dental services and support from specialist nurses will continue to be delivered locally. In addition, specialist outreach clinics will be retained. There's a clear commitment to ensure that what can be done locally will be done locally. Miles Briggs. Thank the Minister for giving way. In terms of St John's in Livingston, has she been aware of the impact this is going to have on services there, potentially for adult patients which are seen by the Edinburgh team there? And what can she say about that and the potential future of that service? Aileen Campbell. Well, what we're clear about is that the proposals that have come forward to us are only about the surgery. And what we want to make sure, though, is that people can access the local support that they need where they need it, close to their home, and continue to get that much needed support, which is essential for the smooth recovery process after surgery. There's also been much criticism from the East about the options appraisal process and the public consultation. And clearly there are lessons for the NHS to learn and to actively reflect upon. And I'm vexed to hear from Yvonne about her concerns that she raised with us at this afternoon's meeting. However, the Scottish Health Council has also indicated it is broadly content with the consultation. Nevertheless, we must take heed of the concerns that have been raised about the process. Now, I very much hope that you will recognise the Scottish Government is listening. This Cabinet Secretary has met with the Edinburgh Surgeon as well as the petitioner to hear their concerns firsthand. Ms Robinson also intends to visit both Edinburgh and Glasgow teams to hear their views. We have also received a steady flow of correspondence and are aware of all the arguments against consolidation. I am pleased this debate has presented a further opportunity to ensure people's voices are heard. I am in the last 10 seconds, I am sorry. You, you can if you wish, Minister. We have some time in hand. Mr Finlay, that is for me to say, not you. Thank you. Uh, okay, yep. Okay. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Jackson Carlo. Oh. Mr Carlo, you have to be better prepared than that. <laughs> shout. Uh, sorry, Jackson uh, my apologies, uh, Deputy Secretary Johnson. I just uh, was interested to hear that uh, Ms Robeson will be visiting both these centres. And I wonder if the Minister, on that basis, uh, would uh, ask the Minister whether she would be prepared to come to Parliament, make a statement on the basis of the evidence she has, so that at a later stage, when she is fully briefed, as she sees on the issue, there would be an opportunity for members to question her on that. Aileen Campbell. I think what I will guarantee is that there will always be a mechanism to make sure that there is a way to ensure that Parliament is kept up to date with the procedures of taking that decision uh, and make sure that Mr Carlo and Miles Briggs and many who have contributed this evening get a chance to, to know uh, when the timeline will be around the decision making. But Ms Robeson, I can just reiterate, is taking careful consideration of all the views, of all the opinions, but wants to make sure she engages with the two teams where the proposals uh, uh, concentrate on. Um, now, while there are clearly differences of opinion on what's best for Scotland's CLEF patients, all views have been and continue to be taken into account. No decision has been made. The decision whether or not to accept the recommendation rests with ministers. 
And again, thank you to the parents and families here this evening. And I can assure you that we will give every consideration to everyone's views and will make a decision in due course. And again, I would like to pay tribute to Miles Briggs for bringing this uh, debate to the Parliament. Pay tribute to the parents who have attended this evening and thank those that have made positive, con constructive contributions this evening. And please continue to engage in the dialogue as we work through uh, the proposals that are presented to ministers. So thank you. Thank you, Minister. I close this meeting of Parliament.